Welcome, everyone. My name is Abby Klostevor, and I'm a registered dietitian and medical affairs manager with Nestle Health Science. I'm excited to introduce today's speaker and assist with today's webinar, Addressing Sarcopenia, Optimizing Protein Intake with Aging. I'm very pleased to present today's speaker, Dr. Doug Padden-Jones. Dr. Padden-Jones is the Sheridan Lorenz Distinguished Professor in Aging and Health in the Department of Nutrition and Metabolism at the University of Texas Medical Branch. He is a fellow of the American College of Sports Medicine and a senior fellow of the Seeley Center on Aging. He has undergraduate degrees from the University of Queensland, a master's degree in exercise physiology from Ball State University, a PhD from the University of Queensland, and completed a postdoctoral fellowship in metabolism in the Shriners Burns Hospital in Galveston, Texas. Research in the Patton Jones Lab is supported by NIH, NASA, and industry grants, and focuses on the regulation of muscle mass and function in healthy and clinical populations. Recent studies have included dietary protein distribution, the effects of physical inactivity in middle-aged and older adults, and leucine metabolism. Welcome, Dr. Patton Jones. Thanks, Abby, and uh, thanks to, to Nestle for, for supporting today's webinar. And uh, I'm glad all of you could join us. So we've, we've got uh, about an hour to talk through several topics related to nutrition and metabolism. I'm, I'm showing you the ob objectives here. So I'd like to, to step through some of the research that's been going on and, and give you my interpretation of how we can apply it in, in clinical practice. So here's first my disclosures. Now, I like to frame these sorts of presentations with my model, how I, I approach my, my research. And I think it's also relevant to, to a lot of clinicians, how you might deal with uh, different clients or, or patients. Now, we know that there's a whole host of factors that can contribute to a, a loss of muscle mass or, or health as we age. Now, in terms of interventions, we're really quite limited. There's, there's probably three main uh, interventions available to us. That's physical activity, optimizing that, and sleep, uh, and pharmacology. Uh, but when, when you really think about it, when it boils down to it, it's nutrition or specifically protein that represents that keystone or that fundamental element that we really have to get in place and optimize in order for any of these other interventions to, to work effectively or optimally. You know, we can have the, the best rehabilitation or exercise regime possible, but if our nutrition support is inadequate, less than optimal, we're going to have subpar results. So that's how we've approached uh, a lot of our, our research. Let's focus on nutrition and get that piece first, and then we can look for, for synergy with other treatment modalities. All right, so let's get down to the, the, the nuts and bolts. We do applied nutrition research. So one of the, the fundamental questions we asked early on is, you know, how much protein do we need? And then how does that vary depending on different people and, and different circumstances? Now, I think all of you should be uh, broadly, specifically uh, aware of the, the RDA for, for protein. Uh, a lot of the public, a lot of the public, uh, public are as well. Uh, one of the problems, though, no one really delves deeper into the, the definition. They look at it as just a, a simple line item where they'll see the 0.8 grams of protein per kilo, and then they'll stop there. And this, this term recommended can be a little bit misleading. When you look a little further into the, the definitions, a few key elements that I've, I've underlined in this, this definition uh, pop up. Uh, just to point them out, the RDA is, is the minimum daily average requirement of good quality protein that meets the requirements of, of almost all healthy individuals. Uh, and you, know, you can pick your body weight close to and you can get a, an idea of the, the grams of protein per day that, uh, that meet the requirements for different size people. But just a few points here. It's, it's a minimum not uh, not a goal or a maximum quantity that you should strive for and then stop. Now, the good quality, we, we'll touch upon that, uh, but I think even a more pressing term here is, is healthy. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about muscle loss with age and obesity, uh, a little bit about type 2 diabetes, but there's a growing large proportion of our population that is probably starting to fall beyond this healthy 
definition. So it does make us question, you know, how many people are we really aiming at with the, uh, with the current RDAs? Now, in terms of position statements for, for healthy older adults, there's uh, several groups uh, around the world, a couple in America and a few in the European Union, who broadly agree. If you look at ProdAge study or an, an ESPEN study, some of the, the authors uh, are on both of the papers, you'll see general agreement that uh, the protein requirements in terms of grams per kilo per day should be increased above the RDA. And, and most of the, the researchers, clinicians would agree that it should fall somewhere in the 1 to 1.2 gram per kilo range. Now, if we look at uh, highly active adults, and this includes older adults, most of the organizations like College of Sports Medicine, the Dietitians of Canada and uh, A&D, again, are, are all pretty well aligned, recommending that protein should be increased. And, and the general number that we see ranges from about 1.2 to, to 1.7. Now, in terms of clinical patient populations, this can vary quite dramatically from uh, intensive care to, to someone who's um, you know, more moderately compromised. Uh, again, we see across the board that the, the protein recommendations are uh, quite a lot higher than the, the basic RDA. Uh, and actually can extend, in the case of critical care medicine, into 2.5 grams of protein per kilo body weight, in, quite often in the, the, the form of trophic feedings or very small caloric loads, so that the bulk of the energy being provided in these critical care cases can come from protein. Uh, but again, there's generally good consensus amongst the researchers and clinicians that for, for most populations with a special need, whether that's activity or a disease state, protein is, is certainly important. Now, just to, to balance the, the, the recommendations against what we're actually seeing in, in most of the hospitals, uh, and, and this, is, this is common sense. A lot of you will see this on a day-to-day -day basis. What our patients actually consume is often less than, than 0.7 grams per kilo. It's a difficulty that we're, we're always going to struggle to overcome. So if, if the RDA defines a, a minimum intake, is there really a maximum? Now, there, there's not a lot of, of great advice here from a prescriptive individual level. Uh, the RDA and these basic definitions are fantastic at a public health level, but for an individual clinical prescriptive benefit, it's not terribly useful. Now, both the Institute of Medicine and the, the Food Nutrition Board haven't identified a tolerable upper intake level for, for protein. And if we look at uh, the acceptable macronutrient distribution range, that, that tells us you can, you're able to consume between 10% and 35% of your total energy in the form of protein. Now, 10% uh, for most of us, you can plug in your own body weights, can actually fall below the RDA, 0.8, for, for a lot of people, uh, whereas 35% can be upwards of 220, 250 grams of protein per day, which is getting into, uh, you know, win a free t-shirt if you can consume that much territory. Rather extreme. So not terribly useful to, to devise you know, guidelines for, for an individual. Is there a danger of too much protein? There, there used to be uh, a, a knee-jerk reaction where people would uh, be up in arms suggesting that increasing protein in the diet would cause kidney damage, uh, and that that's been categorically denied or disproven. Uh, one of the issues was a lot of the early studies showing a link between protein intake and kidney function was performed on kidney dialysis patients. If you've got healthy kidney function, you can eat almost ridiculous levels of protein that we're certainly not recommending and not have any adverse effect on, on kidney. So they're, they're the basic recommendations. You know, what are we eating? Now this is uh, NHANES data, so a large selection uh, of, the, of the public, many thousands of people. And if we look at uh, general protein consumption in the US, on average, we're consuming close to, to 90 grams of protein per day. Now that absolutely varies. For, for younger adults, it's a little higher particularly for males. And for older adults, it does tend to, to drop down. But on average, we've got quite a lot of protein out there. 
Uh, and on a per kilo basis, it comes out to you know, 50, you know, one and a half times the RDA. So here's the, the, the basic spread. Let's dig into this uh, a little bit more. Now, instead of grams of protein per day, uh, a few years ago, we asked a, a really fundamental question. You know, how much protein per meal do we need? And the, the research that my group does, there's uh, several other labs around the world that can do this research as well. We use stable isotopes, so we can effectively take muscle biopsies and, and measure muscle protein synthesis, which is uh, the, the rate of which muscle is being repaired and, and growing. Very sophisticated measure. Now, in this study, you can see here, we, we brought a group of young and older adults, and, and just uh, as a little background, in most of these clinical research studies, younger adults, we will recruit you from about 18 years of age through to about 40, and we'll put you in the, the younger bin. And we leave you alone for several years, quite often, and start recruiting again at about 65 through to around 80, and we'll put you in the older category. So that's what we've done here. The young folks in the red were about 30. The older, and older adults were closer to 70. And we measured muscle protein synthesis first while they were fasting. And right away, that's kind of good news for older adults. There, there was no inherent decrement in muscle protein synthesis in, uh, just due to the aging process. Now, one of the, one of the practical things about this study was that instead of giving a, a protein supplement or a, uh, an amino acid powder, we chose to give them a, an actual intact protein food. And in this case, it was, it was beef. Uh, but quite honestly, if we had have substituted any of the other high quality proteins, milk, dairy, uh, egg, etc., we would have had a similar result. Now, uh, four ounces of lean beef or chicken or salmon contains about 30 grams of protein, and, and that's, a, that's a number we'll revisit. Now, what we did, so measured muscle protein synthesis while our subjects were fasting. We gave them a single meal of four ounces of beef, 30 grams of protein, and as you can see, we saw a 50% increase in muscle protein synthesis in response to this single meal. And the most gratifying thing here was that our older adults responded similarly to the younger folks. Now that's, that's important. That suggests that aging doesn't necessarily impair our ability to take actual protein-rich food and use it to, to build and repair muscle. Does that make sense? All right, so we finished that, that study and we wanted to do a, a follow-up because uh, a dose response study of sorts but also a study that's perhaps more representative of the, the larger portions that we're consuming as a society. You know, you can't get four ounces of anything at most restaurants. So we, we thought, well, let's, let's increase the amount of protein to 90 grams. You know, that's, that's 12 ounces of you know, beef, chicken, etc. The thinking was, well, more protein. If that increases protein synthesis further, yeah, that's good. But clearly, we need to balance that with the extra energy. We're getting fatter, more overweight as a society. Here's the data. You know, sometimes in, in research, when you get a, a no difference result, uh, it's disappointing. No, I don't think this is. I, I think this is, is a really powerful, positive message of moderation. Uh, and to me, it's, this very clearly suggests that somewhere around 30 grams of protein in a single meal represents a ceiling effect or close to the, the, the maximum quantity of protein that you can, you can consume at a single time and effectively use for muscle protein synthesis. Okay, so you know, despite three times as much protein, no extra bump. So that, that really got us thinking and made us uh, question our uh, dietary patterns. Now, just on, on that theme, just adding in uh, physical activity or exercise, here's the, the groups I just showed you before, just the, the protein-rich meal. When we got our young and older adults to do a, a simple bout of leg extension exercise in this case, not particularly strenuous, you know, four sets of 10 reps or, or similar, when they did that exercise bout close to when they consumed the, the, the protein-rich meal, 
we saw in this case an additive synergistic effect of the protein plus exercise. Uh, and again, the, the key finding here was that the response was similar in our young and older cohort. Now, to, to have the ability to, to respond positively to exercise and nutrition as we age is, is certainly a, a goal worth striving for. Now, I'll mention it a couple of times. It's important to look beyond just the bar graphs when you're, when you're looking at clinical research on, on nutrition. To, to qualify for one of these research studies, you know, they're invasive. There's blood draws, there's muscle biopsies. To qualify, you have to be really healthy. So look at these types of data through a lens of this is a best case scenario. This really doesn't represent what's achievable by the, the bulk of the population, but it is a best case. So look at it through that lens and it, it does add perspective. All right, let, let's change direction just a little bit and perhaps talk about some of the, the individuals, people you'll see on a, on a daily basis in your, in your practice. Now, most, most of the six or seven labs around the world that can do this research, we, we agree that if you give almost any healthy adult a moderate amount of protein at a single meal, they'll have a, a robust muscle building protein synthetic response. But what if you've got uh, someone or a group who can't or, or won't consume much protein? Now, for, for a young adult, if you go from, say, 30 grams to 15 grams in, in a single meal, their ability to mount an anabolic response, build muscle, drops by about half. It's kind of a linear proportional change. Makes sense. Here's the problem, though. If you've got a healthy older adult and you go from giving them 30 grams of protein in a meal down to 15 or lower, their ability to mount a robust anabolic response drops off precipitously. You know, this 15 grams falls quite a way below the maximum potential for building and repairing muscle. Now, again, this is, this is nutrition science. It should be a practical, translatable finding. So let's put that in the context of some breakfast foods. Now, I really think that until, oh, gosh, recently, if you went to a, a dietitian or, or certainly a, another healthcare provider like a physician and said, look, this morning I had some fruit uh, and an egg and a glass of milk for breakfast, they'd say, well, okay, two good high quality protein choices in there. You know, well done. But if you start to look at the gram amount, an egg might be close to six grams of protein, a glass of milk, maybe around eight. Maybe you've got 14, 15 grams in that, that meal, which might be fabulous on so many other levels with the other nutrients. But in terms of protein, 14 grams might be okay for a younger adult, but it's certainly less than optimal for an older adult. So let's pursue that line of thinking a, a little bit further and, and think about how we typically eat. Now, if you, if you look at the really simple cartoon here, I think one of the, the fundamental issues is uh, protein distribution. If we think about breakfast, the breakfast meal in most Western countries, the US certainly, it, it tends to be a really heavily carbohydrate-dominated meal. You know, we, we tend to choose the breakfast cereals, the bread products uh, habitually. Now, uh, again, just a simple example of someone who's got 90 grams of protein available to them. That's about average for North America. Uh, if you chose oatmeal uh, for breakfast this morning and added fruit, uh, oats have got a decent amount of protein. You add milk, you get a little bit more. But it's really hard to consume a volume of oatmeal that will give you much more than 10 grams of, of protein. Okay. Now, as we mentioned, 10 grams falls quite a way below that maximum potential for building and repairing muscle. Now, we'll skip over lunch, but we'll go to the other end of the, the day, the evening meal, which is perhaps more problematic. Whereas in, in, again, most Western countries, the evening meal tends to be the dominant uh, protein and energy rich meal. We get the bulk of the day's energy and protein in that, that one sitting. Now, if we might consume uh, 65 grams of, of protein in that evening meal, but if the skeletal muscle is really only able to effectively use uh, 30 
grams, you know, are we making the most of the food protein that we're consuming? Or does this start to slide into that category of overfed but undernourished? Now, I think one of the key elements here is that uh, humans, we can physically eat and store almost as much carbohydrate or fat as we can get our hands on. You know, we can visibly store it. You know, we can't do that with protein. So the, the protein that you consume, say, for, for breakfast is relatively limited in its ability, temporarily limited in its ability to build repair muscle to about a four-hour window following ingestion. You know, we can't store excess or unused amino acids for, for later anabolic use. You know, we don't have a special you know, gland or something to, to store them. You know, we can store them in muscle, but you need to break that muscle down to access them. So if that makes sense. All right. So there's a big concept between how much we eat and how much we can effectively use. So you know, if anyone is ever giving a presentation on, on protein and, and their solution is to, to bluntly throw extra protein, buy this product, have more protein in your diet, uh, I think you need to, to question their, their motives. There's a lot of protein out there for, for most of us, you know, not talking about food deserts, food insecurity. But I, I think for, for most of the population, uh, a better starting framework would be to take some of the protein that we're likely over consuming at dinner and not, not one for one, but add that quantity of protein to breakfast. And the basic concept here, as the, the figure shows, is to get these multiple periods throughout the day, sticking with the basic, you know, typical eating patterns or times where we're getting uh, an opportunity to more optimally stimulate muscle protein synthesis, breakfast, lunch, uh, and dinner. And what we would hope is that over time, uh, months, years, as we'll talk about soon, that will start to translate into the protection of muscle mass, muscle function. All right. Now, let's, let's quickly put um, physical activity into this equation. If you remember the previous slide of the, you know, the 10 gram breakfast eater, 10 gram protein eater, or think about a, a breakfast skipper or, or tea and toaster. If you exercised this morning and you had an apple or nothing at all, you're still going to benefit from that, that exercise, but you've probably missed out on that opportunity to get that synergistic effect of protein plus exercise that I showed you earlier. All right. Now, for, for most of us, healthy adults, that's probably not problematic uh, if it happens relatively infrequently. But if you translate that into a, an at-risk clinical population, or maybe even a, you know, an elite athletic population, that combination of exercise, and you can think of it as rehabilitation, physical therapy, if you like, that combination of activity plus nutrition, protein, might be the only opportunity that day to get a robust bump in muscle growth and repair. So again, back to this figure, by simply having that framework where you're getting moderate amounts of protein coming in regularly, it doesn't really matter when your physical activity bout occurs. You've always got some of the precursor the amino acids available to, to help you get that, that synergistic effect. Now, if you like in the questions, we can talk about timing, but just to say quickly here, it, it's not the critical element. So long as you've got protein and physical activity relatively close, you still stand to, to benefit. All right, so briefly, here's the study that we specifically looked at what I just showed you, the even protein distribution versus skewed. In this study, we, we took the muscle biopsies. We measured muscle protein synthesis over 24-hour periods. Now, both groups had diets, isocaloric, isoenergetic. The only thing we manipulated was the, the distribution of protein. So in this, these cohorts, by simply evenly distributing protein, 30, 30, 30 across each meal, we had a 25% better muscle protein synthetic response compared to doing uh, you know, cornflakes versus entire chicken. All right, a pretty subtle dietary change with the potential to, to have uh, lasting or longer term effects.
Okay, so so let's move on and take some of this uh, nutrition, acute nutrition research, and, and try to apply it to uh, cohorts of individuals who are at risk or could benefit from from improved dietary control. Now, I'm I'm really hoping that most of you are familiar with uh, the term sarcopenia. Uh, again, like the the definitions for for protein requirements, there's lots of groups who are trying to come up with consensus statements. Again, many in Europe, a lot in the U.S. Still debate, but uh, I think one of the nice uh, outcomes is that we we generally agree on on the definition. So if someone's giving you a presentation on muscle loss with age, they'll generally define sarcopenia as this insidious, slow, progressive loss of muscle. And typically, it starts somewhere in your 40s, you know, give or take, depending on how well you've looked after yourself. And it, it's slow. So it's less than 1% of your lean mass per year that you can lose. So over the first decade or two, of slow sarcopenic muscle loss, uh, it's insidious. You may not notice it, uh, and any decrement can be easily overcome by subtle lifestyle changes. And I, I think it's in, also important to just point out, particularly looking at uh, our modern culture, that sarcopenia can exist at, at any body shape or size. So we tend to think of uh, sarcopenic older adults as being frail or more slight, uh, but certainly with uh, the increase in, in type 2 diabetes and, and obesity, we're also seeing a subcategory of the sarcopenic obese. And this is a, a true double whammy where they've lost muscle mass, but also gained uh, tremendous amounts of, of body fat. And, and you can imagine that's associated with a, a dramatic increase in, in risks. Now, when anyone, anytime most, uh, someone's presenting on, on sarcopenia, this is the common sort of slide that they'll either produce or you'll, you'll imagine. And, and you can just imagine someone suffering slight, you know, 1% loss of muscle mass per year from their, from their 40th year onwards. Now, this is great for describing popula population level changes, but for, for dietitians, clinicians who are dealing with individual patients, this doesn't describe what you see on a day-to-day -day basis. And in terms of providing a, a tactical framework to intervene, it's not all that helpful. I think most of what we see on a daily basis falls more along the lines of this catabolic crisis model where, yeah, you may be losing little bits of muscle insidiously, slowly as we age, but it's, it's punctuated by these brief one week or less periods where you're losing uh, tremendous amounts of muscle really quickly. And I, I think it's these really short periods that offer an opportunity to, to aggressively target first with nutrition and then supported by activity or, or other modalities. Now, just very quickly, uh, we're, we're talking about protein largely here. Um, you know, what's, what's driving these, these changes in you know, the loss of muscle, increase of fat. Uh, this, is a, this is an associative graph, absolutely not cause and effect, but it, it, it is interesting to, to look at. Uh, if you look at protein consumption over an equivalent period of time, it's relatively flat. It goes up a little bit. We're generally eating more of everything. But over the last uh, you know, 60 years, consumption of carbohydrate uh, has increased dramatically. And if you look at all of the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee reports, the, the top 10 food groups that we consume on a daily basis are absolutely dominated by, by carbohydrate-based foods. So you know, we're not going to pick um, scapegoats in, in this, this presentation, but if there is an opportunity to intervene, it, it's relatively obvious. If we're going to recommend increasing protein at, at some meals, just to keep simple energy balance, something else has to be reduced. Uh, and, and simple carbohydrate is a, an, an obvious target for a lot of us. All right, so in terms of protecting muscle health, just to go back, yeah, we're facing the, the, the problem of uh, sarcopenic muscle loss with age. 
but I also just wanted to highlight that there, there's a whole host of, of other factors related to our, to our lifestyle, fat gain, insulin resistance, frailty, that we need to, to think about. Now, in terms of research, what can we do to provide a, a platform to, to investigate this? One of the techniques that we've been using recently is uh, bed rest. So it started with NASA. I'll show you one of those slides in a, in a moment where they want to mimic what happens in, in space flight. We put people on, on bed rest to mimic the effects of physical inactivity in our patient population. And this allows us to specifically look at inactivity or disuse without all the comorbidities of the disease-related effects, the inflammation, et cetera. So we can look pretty specifically at what does inactivity, sedentary behavior, do to skeletal muscle. Now, here's, here's a telling slide. And, and for any of you in a, a clinical setting, it, it's an embarrassing slide, but uh, I think it demonstrates uh, an issue that we have. Uh, in one of our older outpa inpatient units, we took some pedometers and accelerometers and put them on our 75-year-olds during a, a four-day inpatient period. Uh, and, and it was embarrassing. We found that 95% of the time that these older adults were with us in the hospital, 95% of the time they were completely physically inactive, zero steps. The 5% of the time that they weren't bed bound, they were taking a small number of steps a minute, 15, so they're shuffling to the bathroom or perhaps getting physical therapy. So we, we have a, a bed rest model in our patient population. Now, we, we've expanded on that. One of the earlier studies, the, this young cohort, this was a, a NASA-sponsored study. They want to know what happens when there's no gravity, so we put you on bed to mimic that. Early on, we took some young, healthy adults, and we put them on bed rest for a month, 28 days. Now, we took a whole host of, of measures, the muscle biopsies, the stable isotopes. This is a, a DEXA scan, similar to what you'll use for osteoporosis, but we're able to measure body composition. So this is effectively lean mass or muscle from the, the hips down. So these young folks lost about a pound. That's about half a kilogram of, of lean mass in, in that month period. So that, that's, not, that's a decent amount of tissue, but it's not clinically relevant. So to, to make it more relevant, we, we took recently, more recently took a, an older cohort, again, closer to 70. We put them on bed rest for 10 days closer to a typical length of stay. And the, the results were, were frankly horrifying. In, in effectively one third the amount of time that they were inactive, they lost two to three times as much muscle mass. You know, and, and again, I'll show, I'll show this is a, a absolutely a best case scenario to qualify for these studies. These are the overachievers of our aging population. Now, you can see we've got a middle-aged cohort in the middle here. Again, a NASA-supported study. The middle-aged demographic is, is largely ignored in, in research. So we had, uh, and I should mention, in the middle-aged and older groups here, it was 50-50 men and women. Uh, terribly important to distinguish. So these 50-year-olds, phenotypically, they looked just like the younger crowd before we put them on to bed rest. Same strength, same muscle, et cetera. They looked youthful. I honestly thought that would fall somewhere in between. Uh, there's no good news here. This, this was dreadful. These, these healthy middle-aged adults lost muscle just as quickly as their parent would have. Okay. So no good message here, but uh, I think it does help us think about protecting muscle like we do bone health. You know, it's drummed into us now to start protecting muscle health, bone health as a, a young adult. Okay, don't wait until you hit a Medicare mandated age to start you know, behavioral lifestyle changes. You can go from bulletproof to compromised really quickly. Now, as I mentioned, the best case scenario, just to show you what can happen with a, an inpatient population, this group were with us for three or four days uh, and they're losing, this is close to 15% of their, their total leg mass. So they're, they're all being treated largely for community acquired pneumonia but we're discharging them after a few days with this uh, two pounds less muscle in just their legs. So, so catastrophic consequences of simple disuse in a, in a really quick 
short period of time. Uh, now, just quickly to, to show you um, some of the emerging areas and, and perhaps uh, allow us to distinguish or, or find who's more at risk. This is the middle-aged cohort that I just showed you. Now, these are 50-year-old men versus uh, age-matched women. So you can see that a 50-year-old man is going to lose about as much muscle as they ever will, whereas a, a middle-aged woman still has a more youthful, protective effect when they're put on bed rest. But here's, here's an issue. When we go from 50 years of age through to about 70, uh, the men don't change much. They're, they're already losing as much as they are. But the women, there's a, there's a real problem clearly associated with menopause and its consequences that greatly accelerate the, the loss of, of muscle and, and function during that 20-year that 20 per, 20 period. So that is absolutely a, a group that we need to be particularly aware of if we're admitting them to hospital or we know they're going to be uh, physically inactive for a short period of time. Uh, and, and again, just to, to highlight, it's not all that simple. We don't all have this homogeneous response. We, we all know someone who can look at a cake and gain body fat or, or look at a barbell and put on muscle. Same thing with disuse. We, we have sec, you know, segments of the population who we put on bed rest and nothing really happens. They don't lose much muscle at all. Conversely, we have a, a group of tertile. We put them on bed rest. They lose muscle hand over fist. Now, right now, we can't identify who's who before the fact. But you know, this, this guy, that, that dot down the bottom who's losing more than two kilograms, that's a tremendous amount. We absolutely want to identify these people who are at that much risk early on uh, and develop a, an a intervention very quickly. All right. So th this last section, let's, let's talk about the interventions. Uh, and, and again, going back to that conceptual model we've focused on nutrition, not everyone can exercise or get out of bed. Some pharmacologic support is, is useful for some patients, but not everyone. But we do have to feed absolutely all of our patients. So let's look for the most pragmatic, efficient, uh, and effective choice. Now, we, we can provide just blunt additional protein energy supplementation. Now, that's, that's problematic on, on a few levels, fatty, level, fatty uh, liver infiltration and then satiety issues. So one, one supplement that we've been looking at heavily is the uh, essential amino acid leucine. So yeah, it's one of the, the branch chains, so it's one of the building blocks of, of protein. You can find it in most of the high-quality protein foods. I'll, I'll show you a figure in, in a moment. So you don't have to buy a, a powdered special form of it. Now, the thing about leucine is that it plays a key regulatory role in, in protein synthesis and translation initiation. It seems to work through the mTOR pathway, and it works as a, a, a switch or a dimmer switch to turn on the, the, the muscle building repairing machinery. And it seems that you need approximately three grams of leucine in a single meal to, to effectively serve as that trigger. Now, you can get three grams in about four or five ounces of lean beef or dairy or the equivalent. So it, it's not that dramatic, large quantity. Now, I do want to say that the, the benefits in the media uh, are largely overstated. I think I'll show you there is absolutely some use for clinical populations, but for, for most healthy populations, and I won't talk about elite athletes, they're, they're you know, kind of a different monster, but for most recreationally active people, once you've turned on muscle protein synthesis with just good old regular protein-containing foods, it's turned on. So adding leucine to sufficient protein doesn't give you a magical bump. So if you're getting enough, you don't need more, if that makes sense. All right. So yeah, we talked about protein quality uh, a little bit. Now, there's, there's a lot of nuance and detail here. There's, uh, you've got the PDCAS that is kind of defi defined there for you. There's, there's a couple of new methods for defining protein quantity quality. Uh, but as you'd, as you'd expect, they generally rank the protein sources, animal proteins, you know, milk, eggs, whey, et cetera, high. And it's capped at one for, for PDCAS, whereas some of the, the 
plant-based proteins tend to, to score uh, a little bit lower. Now, that absolutely doesn't mean they're lower nutrition quantity quality, uh, but certainly in protein quality, they, they are. Uh, and, and yeah, as I mentioned, you can find leucine in everyday foods. Uh, dairy has the highest proportion. If you're going to look for a supplement, whey has is, is got the, the greatest of all of those. But you can find it in uh, regular protein-containing foods without too much effort. So let me show you what we, uh, what we did. This is the middle-aged bed rest cohort that I showed you, half men, half women. The intervention in this case was uh, a teaspoon, literally, about four grams of leucine that we added to breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Now, we controlled their diets rigorously for, for this study. These are all muscle function outcomes. So the, the control group got alanine, a non-essential amino acid. So in terms of muscle endurance, now this is putting you on a leg extension, doing 20 repetitions, and watching your fatigue curve. The blue typical function loss. The green group, the, the group we gave the leucine to, they had a startlingly protective effect of the, the leucine supplement. When we put our volunteers on a, a bike and do a, did a traditional VO2 max test, again, we saw this robust, partially protective effect. And again, with all of our, our strength outcomes, uh, we saw a similar pattern of leucine protecting muscle function. Uh, now, just to compare that to uh, earlier testosterone studies, this was better. This was a better result, just with nutrition. Now, here's um, just finishing that that thought. Here's the the DEXA scan showing lean muscle. This is whole body in this case. So, by seven days, the control group had already lost all the muscle. So, after that that first week, the rate of loss absolutely slows down. But halfway through, we're encouraged. Leucine seems to be having that, that similar partial protective effect. But when we look at what's happened the last seven days of this protocol, leucine group lost muscle just as quickly as the control group. And again, that's a nice reality check. I think it's unreasonable to expect something like nutrition by itself to have a, a chronic protective effect. So, yeah, it's probably not useful for, for chronic disability, inactivity, hemiparotic stroke, uh, et cetera. But, you know, if you are physically disabled, not able to move for a short period of time, it may very well be effective. I think the final study I'll show you here, we tried to, to do a follow-up study to make it a little bit more practical. Now, leucine, it's great. You can give a small amount, but it tastes dreadful. So we wanted to see if we could use whey protein which comes in chocolate and different flavors, as a, like a leucine delivery vehicle. And in this bed rest study, we, we simply improved the, the quality of the diet with whey protein. So we weren't supplementing, but most of the protein that these volunteers were consuming came from whey in this instance. So there's the, there's the design, very similar. If you look at the bottom, the loss of lean mass. So the, the whey protein group, they consume the same total amount of protein, but by improving the quality of the protein with, with whey, they lost half as much lean mass, which is great. But the figure here is particularly interesting. By simply giving them better quality of protein, they actually lost quite a bit more fat mass. Now, again, for, for clinical populations, and we can we could talk about bariatric surgery or, or any of the other extreme groups, this is highly desirable, getting a... Uh, anabolic protective effect on muscle while absolutely not increasing fat accumulation and perhaps promoting fat utilization or loss. So simple study, can't make too many grand claims, but this would be really interesting to see if this can be taken and moving, taken forward in some longer term trials. Uh, a couple of quick comments on some of the epidemiological long-term studies. Now, these are, are really hard to do do training studies for, for 12, 16 weeks and try and detect the difference. And there's a list of them here. You're, able, you're welcome to look at them in detail. It's very difficult to tease out large differences when you add protein to something like a, an exercise regime. But in general, most of the studies suggest that there is a, a slight positive effect of 
slightly increasing protein intake with exercise on, on a host of outcomes. And, and I think the big takeaway here, despite a lot of the issues with the study design inherent or not, there's no negative consequence of moderately increasing protein. And again, as a reminder, we're absolutely not taking protein to the extreme levels. All right, so to finish off, some recommendations. Now, we, we can obviously deep dive into the, the recommendations and talk about mechanisms and, and pathways, but, but I suspect for most of the, the patients, clients that each of you deal with, you, you need a, a more broad starting point that allows you to, to deeper dive from there. So what I'd suggest for on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of lifestyle, habitual practice, if we can recommend establishing a, a dietary framework that includes a, a moderate amount of high quality protein at each meal. Now, we can talk about moderate. That doesn't mean 30 grams. It means different things for different people. High quality protein, basic framework, and then absolutely modify it to accommodate individual needs. You know, what are your energy requirements? How much physical activity are you doing? Are you healthy or ill? Do you have body composition goals? Extra, you know, lose fat, put on muscle, etc. So that's a, that's a decent starting point to try and change habitual practice. Now that's, that's super hard. I think the area we can have the most immediate benefit from is these periods of catabolic crisis. These three to seven day periods where you're physically inactive, compromised, where you can lose tremendous amounts of muscle really quickly. So during these periods, just meeting the RDA is clearly insufficient. But the blunt addition of just pushing extra food is counterproductive as well. I think if we can uh, recommend aggressive support, starting with high-quality protein, maybe something like whey or, or leucine, to try and blunt that tremendous loss of muscle and perhaps promote recovery. Now, if we can show eventually that these, this sort of support can impact 30-day readmission rates, and the other metrics driving healthcare, uh, I think it'll has the potential to fundamentally change our medical care. Now, with that, I just want to acknowledge my my team. Can't do this by myself, and I turn it back over to Abby for some questions. Thank you all so much. Great, thank you, Dr. Padden Jones, for a very informative presentation. Um, we do have a few questions already here. So, uh, the first one. Some people um, are smaller in size. So is that 30 gram recommendation, is that kind of across the board or for someone who is smaller or even larger, could you would you go higher or lower in protein? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. And, and again, I think it's, uh, it speaks to how, how practitioners should interpret research studies. So you know, when you're designing a research study, you, you have to pick your, your variables and define what you're doing. So we chose 30 grams for, for that study. Now, that's absolutely not, that's, uh, that's not the recommendation for everyone. It's, it's where we set the parameters for that research. So a, a clinician absolutely has to take the research findings uh, and interpret and translate it from a, a practical perspective. But yeah, 30 grams of protein for a frail 105-pound uh, nursing home resident is, is ridiculous. That's you know, the, a large proportion of their total energy requirements, and there's going to be satiety, perhaps dentition issues. That's going to make that you know, just unfeasible. Similarly, if you've got a 250-pound uh, athlete, 30 grams is a, 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 it's a minor annoyance. It's a small snack. Uh, but the concept of, of moderate... Uh, still applies. Now, that, that's up to you to uh, come up with a metric, whether that's 20% you know, protein per meal per day, something like that. But you do want to avoid the, uh, the extremes, you know, the breakfast skipping or the bucket of chicken eating. But uh, yeah, good question. Great. Thank you. Um, a few coming in around um, vegetarian or plant-based diets. How do the, the recommendations change or, or stay the same based on that? Yeah, the, um, the, the formal recommendations don't really provide a, a great deal of insight. Uh, I think um, from the, the researcher's perspective, you can do really well uh, on a, on a plant-based diet. And uh, 
So yeah, uh, and even if you're not exclusively plant-based, you know, the vast majority of what we're eating should be plant-based. You know, 70, 80 percent would be would be a great step forward. Now, said that saying that, if you are going to uh, adopt a, a pretty strict plant-based diet, you do have to pay a lot more attention to what you're consuming. And in all likelihood, it's going to mean a greater volume of uh, food or plants that do contain protein. Uh, and just as a, a hold this place, uh, we've got a, a study going on right now where we're going to look at that complementary protein question. Do you need to combine incomplete protein sources at a, at a same meal? But yeah, basic result, basic answer, you can do absolutely fine, but you do have to pay a, a lot more attention and perhaps be prepared to eat a lot more food. Great, thank you. Um, so there's a question on whether sarcopenia is reversible. Mm -hmm. It is. It is. And I, I think perhaps one of the biggest obstacles is um, our human nature. We, we're creatures of habit. So, you know, I mentioned protecting muscle health and, and bone health being something you focus on in your early adult life and not weight. Once you've been eating or exercising or just doing something a certain way for years and years, that's really hard to, to change, yeah, particularly if you're in your, your 60s or 70s facing sarcopenic muscle loss, function changes. That's difficult from just a sheer practical level to, to start exercising, changing some of these long-held practices. Uh, but if you, if you do, uh, a lot of research groups have shown over and again, if you've got older adults who exercise, pretty intensely. It's, it's not just a case of going through the motions. You can improve. You can put on muscle mass. You can regain uh, a lot of function. But uh, again, for the, the far preferred approach is to build up a lot of reserves in an early adult life. So you've got uh, just a safety buffer rather than trying to, to recapture youth at a, at a later age. Great, thank you. Um, a question here on hospitalized patients who might be on, um, you know, an enteral feeding, and, uh, and the effect of, you know, continuous versus bolus feeding. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's that's a great topic, and um, there's um, some great research coming out of uh, Teresa Davis's group in Baylor up in in Houston. So they've they've published a couple of really nice studies where they've bolused. Uh, leucine or, or protein uh, in animal models and also some, some kids, some patient populations, and, and found a whole host of improved outcomes. So, uh, yeah, that, that's really encouraging and that, that's a really interesting line of research to, to follow. Now, I can only comment on the, on the protein muscle building repair side of things. There's a whole other question related to the delivery of the other nutrients. But I, I think it's absolutely something to, to consider uh, bolusing the protein, uh, allowing that, that normal sort of refractory period where the blood amino acids peak, turn on the building process, uh, and then diminish, allowing the, the, the process to, to reset. That seems to be the, the, the key for, for long-term you know, growth repair. Great, thank you. Okay, last question here, because um, we're running out of time. Uh, you talked a lot about uh, the importance of physical activity and uh, exercise. Is there a, kind of a minimum amount of exercise that's required to, to help with that anabolic effect? It's, it's really tricky. So for, for most of the, the, the audience, uh, any sort of activity you can do is going to be beneficial. Now, if you're using a, an exercise regime, it could be yoga, swimming, cycling. That probably doesn't matter so much. Uh, let me quickly mention a study. It was done by Stuart Phillips and uh, his research team up at McMaster. It was a great study. He took some older adults and did kind of a Canadian winter study. He took them from habitually performing, I think it was 8,000 steps a day, which is decent. Uh, and he, he didn't restrict them completely, but they were only able to perform 1,500 steps a day. So kind of you know, locked up in the house. And he did that for about two weeks, and he found bed rest light type results. So they lost a considerable amount of muscle uh, and function just over that brief period of being largely sedentary. So in, in terms of minimal or having like an RDA for exercise, we, we haven't defined it yet. 
but but certainly it's uh, you know it's more than than just uh, basically moving around a little bit each day. I think purposeful activity is, is clearly needed. Great, thank you. All right, well, thank you, Dr. Pat and Jones, and thanks to our audience for your participation. On behalf of the Nestle Nutrition Institute, we hope you found this information useful to your practice and enjoy the rest of your day.